So as I figure these out, you'll see me do something like 91 times 113. Oh, jeez. Sorry. Divided by that 338. And then, of course, you come up with a approximation. And in this case, I get 30.4. Does that make sense to you guys? And then for the partial, it would be um, 55 times 113 divided by 338. And I get 18.4. And then for the no response, I get 192 times 113 divided by 338. And that would give me 64.2. And I'm going to be using these numbers later when I do some other statistical analysis. That's why we're calculating them now. For the Zoloff, I'm in the next column now, so it's going to be a 109. So then I have 91 <coughs> times 109 and 338 for a grand total of 29.3. And then next I have the 55 times that 109 divided by 338, and that's 17.7. And then I have the 192 for the no response times the 109 for the column divided by the table total of 338 for a nice large number of 61.9. And I do this for all three different treatments. I should move the placebo over a little bit. And maybe I'll go with orange. So then for the placebo, um, in the last one, 116 is going to be my new number in the parentheses. So I'm going to have 91 times 116 divided by 338, which is 31.2. And then the next row is 55 times that same column of 116 for the placebo divided by the table total of 338 for a total of 18.9. And then I have the last one, which was the 192 times that column total of 116 divided by 338 for a grand total of 65.9. Um, Questions on finding any of these? Row times column or column times row, doesn't matter which way you go. And if you're not fast enough in the writing, don't worry, they're also online. Okay? Let's go to the next page then. Now, once you have these things, <coughs> You can calculate your chi-square statistic, of course, but you need to know your degrees of freedom. So one of the crazy things is when you're using tables, there is a way that you have to calculate your degrees of freedom, and here's how you do it. You take your column total, and you subtract off one. You take your row totals, you subtract off one, and then you multiply. So for us, we had columns of three, rows of three. Take one off of each. That's two by two, really. Multiply that, you get four. So for ours, we know that our degrees of freedom from our example is going to be four when we get done. And our chi-square statistic works the same way as it has in the past otherwise. So as I'm doing my chi-square statistic, I know that for me, the chi-square is equal to the sum of my observed minus my expected squared divided by my expected. 
So in our cases, um, we had the observed values in each of these columns. So you can go back and look at the table if you want to. But we had 27 minus 30.4. We square that and we divide by the 30.4. That was the expected value that we found. And then the next one would be 27 minus 29.3. Square that, divide by the 29.3. And you keep on going. So 37, for example, minus 31.2 squared and divide by 31.2 and it keeps on going. Okay, so now to do this by hand is a pain. So I would never do this by hand. Sorry? I would not do this by hand. Well, let me just show you then. So what I would do, if I'm not doing this by hand, Will, is I would say, first of all, I would take every single one of these first numbers, these observed data, and I would take everything that's observed and I'd put it in L1. So you're going to have a list in L1. And then I would take, and in L2, I would put in all of my expected values. And then what I would do for L3, this is just me, again, L3, uh, I would probably do L1 minus L2. And Mr. Bart does this differently than I do, just so you know. In L4, In L4, I would make that L1, or sorry, L3, L3 squared. squared. And in L5, I would make that L4 divided by, yeah, L2. No. No, I won't, because that's not going to work the way I want it to. Why? Because you have to divide first before you before you add them all up, right? Squared. Oh, I guess I could. Yeah. L4 divided by L2, was it? Yeah. And then at the end, after I've done all that, I would go stat, calc, enter on L5. Yeah. Because what you want to do is you want to look at L5's sum. Like sum of x? So it's the sum of x, yep. So then look at what? the sum of x. Because L5 has everything you need in each pieces, and you just look at the sum of that. Now if you do that right now, what you should see is the following. You should get that your chi-square is equal to 8.77. Okay, so finding our p-value again, it's the same as before, chi, chi CDF, 8.77 is our chi-square value, comma 99, because you're going to 99, uh, place pass, 0, and then 4 for the degrees of freedom from our row column thing. And then you draw your conclusion, which is the same as we have in the past. Our result, or one more extreme, would occur six point seven percent of the time if H O was true.
Oh, you dirty dog. Since our p value of 0 0.067 is greater than alpha, which equals 0 0.05. We fail to reject HO. That is, we don't have convincing evidence that the that there is a difference in the distributions of using St. John's wort Zoloft or a placebo. So Aaron brought up that when we were talking about it in our HO, we talked about the word responses. So let's add that in there. Don't forget to add that in. Put in responses. In our last part to this lesson, we're actually going to go through the whole four-step process like we've done in the past. Again, it's kind of like vomiting after a while. You just kind of spit it all out. So in the next part, this talks about all the rules. We have that four-step. First of all, you're going to state what's going on. HO is there is no difference. HA is there is a difference. Then you talk about your plan, and in our plan, there are four parts again. You're going to talk about your inference method, which is the chi-square test, and they call it homogeneity when you're working with tables. Homogeneity means everything's the same. Okay, That's why there's no difference. So when you see this phrase, and remember, you're always looking for clues, because the big idea is how do you know which test to use and when you use it. So homogeneity means you're using these two-way tables for categorical data with multiple pieces. So before it was just the chi-square test, now we say the chi-square test for homogeneity. You can say that that's what we're on. Next, we're going to talk about randomness, just like before. We're going to talk about large sample size, meaning all of your count, your expected counts are more than five, or equal to five. Um, and then you're going to talk about independence, and that's when you talk about the populations at least ten times your sample. The same as we've always talked about with proportions. Whenever you see proportions, be thinking about that. And then after that, we're going to do the math. And when we're doing the math, the big new thing here is that that's different with these two-way tables is this expected count we find from the two-way tables by taking the row column times the column, the column total, row total, column total divided by table total. We do the chi-square again as usual. And then the other new thing, of course, is that when we talk about degrees of freedom, we have to take and multiply the column total minus 1 times the row total minus 1. Our conclusion works exactly the same way we've do, do, been doing it in the past, so that's going to be the same as before. Okay, so way back when in Chapter 1, an alternate example examined the distribution of superpower preferences. You guys remember that? Yeah. Of a random sample of 200 children from 9 to 17 in the UK who filled out a survey. And do American children have these same preferences? So guess what? They did one with 250 children in the U.S. ages 9 to 17. And they filled out a census thing. And here are the results. So again, we have row totals, we have column totals, and we have a table total. And we're 